Rider TV live from the Wild Wind Boat Park. And yes, it has been more champagne sailing uh, again. Too much champagne sailing all at the same time um, can make you go blind, but it hasn't been too bad. So today was more kind of champagne light. Um, really good wind for practicing all those skills like uh, helming on the trapeze and flying the spinnaker in the stronger wind, perhaps for the first time. Yesterday, we held a fantastic round the rock race because there wasn't so much wind. Um, it was probably about, I don't know, 17, 18 knots in the biggest gusts. And we went a long way. Hi, Robin, nice to have you on board. And hello to everybody else who's just tuned in. I've just tuned in myself. Um, yeah, so I did have something really uh, interesting to start off with, but I don't think I can remember. <laughs> hello, Adam, and hello, Kuro5150. Uh, good to have you guys all on board for this very exciting Q&A session. Chepus, uh, Chesapeake Challenge, hold on, to 2020, happened this weekend, 27 miles, both days, took second place overall. Nice one, Russell, well in. Uh, that's Russell, of course, who um, was one of the main features of last week's Show Us Your Cat. Lorenzo, hey, how about there? Yeah, it's pretty good. Hi, James, good to see you, albeit I can't see you, but I dare say you can see me right now. Yeah, so, oh, hi, Kush, nice to have you on board. Hi, Dominic. Bonjour with their F-18 Cirrus. The Cirrus is a very nice F-18. Now, yeah, that was weird. All right, um, for some reason, my screen's gone a little bit dark. Uh, there's always something. Hi, Sean, nice to have you on board. Yeah, so, uh, hi, Tom. Hi, Adam. Um, finding some cheap decent RS 700s, nice. So the RS 700 is a, hi CAD Cam, nice to have you on board. Uh, 700 is a single-handed boat. I am Gabba 99, nice to have you on board. Hello Italy. Um, yeah, so the RS 700 single-handed monohull with racks that you trapeze from, I believe. Does it on the 700? Can't remember. Um, but it has a spinnaker and a trapeze. Uh, so it's a really good boat. It's quite long for a single-handed boat, but uh, very quick. Bit, a bit easier to manage than the 600, even though it has got a spinnaker, it's a bit more stable. Um, yes, Lorenzo, I am here all year round. Uh, this is just a great place to live. Really like it. And we've got Jason. Uh, hi. Took the Hobie 16 out Sunday, 15 knots on a local lake. Very nice too. Um, whether that's 15 knots of boat speed or 15 knots of wind, either way, that is the sort of gas we want to be cooking on. Uh, 15 knots of anything is when things start getting just lively enough. Okay, yeah, the 600 has got the racks. Uh, sorry, the 700 has got the racks that you trapeze off. What if, aha, uh -huh, good question from Hero Dax. Nice question, Hero Dax. What do you do if your mast gets stuck in the ground when capsized? Then what we somehow need to manipulate the boat into doing is to turn it so that if this is the mast and this, this is the, the boat, so that the wind is not blowing the mast further onto the ground. So we have to try to turn the boat so that the wind is gonna blow the boat off the ground. So that is very much like what we would do in a normal capsize. We can either, our two options, what we can do is we can either go to the front of the hull to uh, try to get the boat to come around that way, or we could go back to the back of the hull 
to get the boat to come around that way. It just depends on the angle of the boat to the wind. But uh, just standing in the middle of the boat hoping for the best or perhaps trying to right the boat against the mast being in the bottom is possibly not going to have a good effect. So definitely either put all of the weight on the boat at the front or the back and that should start to turn the boat one way or the other which should stop the mast from getting driven further into the bottom. You're welcome, no problem. All right, I think we're into the scrolling back section already. Uh, Jason, wind. Um, oh, 15 knots of wind, nice. Yeah, 15 knots of wind is the sweet spot because that is when you can start to double trapeze on most types of catamaran. Um, on certain types of catamaran, you can, of course, double trapeze in less wind than that, like on um, an F-18, F-16 uh, tornado or something. You could, you're probably double trapezing upwind in 10 knots, maybe less, maybe nine knots of wind, depending on your crew weight, of course. Lovely. All right. Hello, Steve-o. Nice to have you on board. As always, any idea where to get a snap shackle in the UK? I'm looking and some seem cheap and some seem expensive. I think the number one brand of snap shackle in the world is Wichard. Um, if you can get a Wichard snap shackle for your top main sheet block, then you really are winning in the who's got the best snap shackle competition. That's Wichard, I believe it's a French brand. Uh, they were used a lot with uh, kite surfing back when people used to snap shackle the, um, the kite onto their harness. A little bit dangerous by today's standards. But um, Wichard is the brand that you wanna find if you wanna get a really nice one. And I wouldn't be afraid of spending, I don't know, 15, maybe 20 pounds on a snap shackle because this is, oh, Chris has got a Selden, nice. Um, that Wichard is the only one I'm familiar with, but the Selden, I'm sure, is an absolute banger. But it's worth spending a bit of money on because it is something that is gonna be with you for um, some time. So get a good one, it will last you years. That's 20 pounds, well spent, okay. All right, scrolling back. I'm sure that didn't help at all, actually, Steve. Um, but there you are. Okay, we've got Colin. Hi, Joe. What's the best single-handed catamaran? Oh, it's all right. I'm going this way, John. You, this side is safe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. This is live. What's the best single-handed catamaran for getting high speeds? Uh, there can be only one choice there, surely, and that would be the foiling A-class. But, um, yeah, hmm, interesting. Yeah, I, it's not really anything I've ever really thought about before. Uh, did, obviously, uh, if you saw the video, put in a 21 and a half knots on an FX1, but then it was very windy and pretty much anything would have been absolutely gunning it in that breeze. Um, the Hobie 14 will get you up to about 20 knots, I think, uh, perhaps a little bit more. Um, the Hobie 16 single-handed, of course, very good. That um, in the right hands with a reasonably uh, heavy rider, like someone of 80 to 100 kilos, that's capable of doing 22 knots, something like that. Yeah, like Chris says, if you're big enough, you can single-hand anything. But the A-Class is the, um, uh, the fastest dedicated single-handed boat as far as I know at the moment. But something like an F-16, another good option, because with the F-16, uh, it's got a spinnaker and single-handed mode with the F-16 is mainsail, spinnaker, trapeze, dagger boards. Um, there are F-16s that uh, foil as well. So the F-16 is also a very good single-handed choice. All right, 
scrolling back. All right. Here's Adam back talking about the RS700. The racks are adjustable, so it has a broad weight range. Can we say spectrum? Do you think spectrum's a good word for that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, because obviously the wider, the more leverage, yes. There we go. So the RS700 is a good choice. Uh, it doesn't have to be a musto skiff. I think the musto skiff is significantly more expensive as well. All right. Kuro 5150 went sailing on a tiger last Sunday, got hit by a wave while trapezing. Feet were swept away and fell like a bowling pin. The only thing you can do to stop this uh, action from happening is to anticipate it. Just look at the waves that are coming towards you. Um, and if you can see that perhaps there is a wave coming and you might get dumped a bit into the wave, then get a wider stance on the trapeze and brace against the direction of the wave. Here we go, let's do some bracing. Um, a bit of bracing here. Uh, we've got a good angle for a bit of bracing. Okay, there we go, there's the angle for a bit of bracing. Um, so, can we see this? Am I in a good spot? Okay, so here's our normal trapezing stance. If you want to be the king of the racers, angle your feet slightly forwards. Of course, we're going to be leaning back. But then if we can see that there's going to be a big wave coming, or perhaps there's going to be something happening with the wind, anything that's going to put you off balance, then just widen your stance. If you think you're going to get pushed backwards, bend your front leg. And what really works well is if you turn your whole body towards the back of the boat, bend your knees a little bit and kind of get ready to take the impact with your buttocks and bend the knees so you're really pushing against what that impact is going to be, then there's less of a chance of getting knocked over. All about shoving the buttocks into the wave. Um, all right, scrolling back. I think that was a very good answer. Oh, hello, Chris. Chris is beaming in from Texas. Of course, Chris is sailing Prindle 19 and feet, oh, hold on. Oh, okay. I think Chris is uh, responding to a lot of the comments from before, so I won't answer all of, well, go into too much detail on what Chris is saying there, but uh, Chris is a very experienced sailor in Texas, and his Prindle 19 is featuring Dyneema rigging. This is a very good feature. Um, so he's not using any metal wires on his boat at all, as far as I know. All of it is Dyneema. If you want to get Dyneema rigging on your boat, a very good thing. Um, yeah, nothing I can do about the sound there, Chris. Um, this is just uh, Greek clockwork internet that we're dealing with. Um, but if you do want to get the Dyneema rigging on your boat, you could message Chris on here and get in touch that way. And Chris can put you in touch with the guys who are making the Dyneema rigging does look like a very good idea. Oh, Forstay is the only wire that he's using. Okay, all right, scrolling back. Scrolling back, okay, we're scrolling back. Wow, there's a lot of scroll back already. Um, all right, Hayden asks, what's the difference in sailing a cat versus a monohull? I raced 420s. Want to get a boat mainly, mainly for single-handed, but occasionally a second. Ooh, weight, 68 kilos. Yeah, it does sound like um, the 
first and most obvious choice would be the Hobie 14. Um, reason it's an obvious choice uh, to get into some single 14 for not too much money. So it's good. And the Hobie 14 is a boat which will punish anything other than really, really good technique. So to get your technique nailed on a catamaran, the 14 is not going to let you get away with anything other than good technique. Other boats which will do the job, but without as much, um, uh, what do you call it? Not as nicely, um, but still do the job very well would be something like uh, a Dart 16, would be nice. Um, a Dart 15 even, depending if you want a plastic boat or a fiberglass boat. And there's, there's a lot of boats out there that will do the job, but perhaps even the Prindle 15. I don't know much about the Prindles, but I think the Prindle 15 will certainly do the job there as well. So there's a few good options, but the Hobie 14 is for life and it is an active racing class. Um, so there we go. Okay. Oh, I see most of the comments are actually Chris, uh, answering people's questions. So what I could do is I could just, um, leave this running you can ask questions and chris could answer um because uh chris knows a lot about catamaran sailing but um i'll keep going um and uh see how we get on i'm just scrolling back all right cool. where am i Oh, okay, I see most of the comment. Okay, we've got Sick Roft. Somebody killed our top cat catamaran. Oh my goodness. Um, I'd have to say, how did your top cat get, catamaran get killed? Did somebody sail into you? We've got Jeffrey, good morning from Hale, Michigan. What's the best way to repair a tear in the sail in the batten? my mast side of the batten yeah um if it's just a, what what a lot of the time happens in the batten pockets is if your batten wasn't tight enough and you you'll get the early signs of your batten's not being tight enough by there being vertical creases in the batten pocket if you've got vertical creases in the batten pocket tighten the batten up uh to get rid of those creases in the pocket because what can happen if you've got those vertical creases is the batten can pull back a bit and then it can pull back a bit and then actually poke out next to the cap near to the mast. Um, so uh, first thing, make sure your battens are tight enough. And then if the batten has just poked a small hole near to the cap next to the mast, then you can just unscrew the cap, or if it's riveted on, uh, you might have to drill the rivets out and then re-rivet it. Afterwards, um, but uh, take the can, then you could put a small piece of self-adhesive Dacron called Insignia onto the hole, and that, should do it but if the tear in the sail is more than just a, a small vertical split then you will need to take it to a sail maker uh, what i've learned from sail makers is make sure you wash your sails before taking it to a sail maker because otherwise what can happen is they'll want to wash the sails before they put it on their table because they don't want salt on the table that they use for fixing the sails. So they'll actually charge you for the time that it takes to wash the sail. So wash your sail first before taking it to a sail maker.
All right, scrolling back. Scrolling back. Um, I've got uh, I've got Chris there. Unfortunately, can't watch you from live anymore. He's at work. Oh no! All right. Well, Chris, when you tune in later, nice to see you. Sorry, couldn't make it at the time. Oh, and there's Chris saying exactly what I just said. I could just leave all of this to Chris, and um, I'll shoot off and have a beer. Um, Okay, Kuro5150 is saying he's taking ownership of an Inter 18 next weekend. Really, really good value for the money, the Inter 18. Um, so that is going to give you a lot of good times. All right, hello, Yasure Pano. Okay, we've got Panos from Patra. Check that Hobie Cat has a racing calendar each year for many categories. What is the level of those races? Can somebody who sells, sorry, uh, can someone who sells a lot be competitive or just take part? Yes, um, with, with most races that are going on, um, there's no qualification required to get involved. Um, for certain races, you do need to qualify, but for most, you don't need to qualify at all anybody with the right kind of boat for that event can go and take part, uh, take part in that event. So what you need to make sure if it's a Hobie event is all of the parts. Um, yeah, I'd say all of the parts on your boat are original Hobie. You, I'm pretty sure that with an official Hobie event, which these days would probably only be a Nationals a Europeans or a Worlds, um, but for any of those events, the parts that definitely need to be original Hobie would be the trampoline and the sails, the battens, um, and then of the obvious stuff like the hulls, the mast, all the beams. Um, the rudder blades, I believe you can have any rudder blades on your boat at an event. And then if your boat hasn't got a valid measurement certificate, you might have to go through a measurement process at the event. Certainly at the international events, you do have to get things measured. Um, and there is a bit of cost involved with a lot of events as well. There will usually be an entry fee. Um, you'd usually have to be a member of the class association as well, but anybody can enter. Can enter an event. At the bigger events like the Hobie 16 Worlds, for example, then you might have, you will have to pre-qualify because um, the event has a limited amount of places that they can offer. I believe at all of the Hobie 16 events, they limit it to 120 boats. So um, you may have to pre-qualify for a Hobie 16 event but for most other events, you can usually just enter online and then pay your entry fee, turn up, make sure your boat's got valid insurance, measurement certificate and all the papers. And then there you are, you're off. Lovely. You do get some people at events who perhaps, let's say, are not the most experienced sailors of that class in the world. Hello, Keith. Nice to have you on board with us in Okinawa, Japan. My Cassio, oh, hello, we've got a watch, pro a watch question. Cassio G-Shock has died. Okay, um, yeah, I'm using the Locosys GW60, but I'm only using that for the GPS. I'm not using it as a normal watch, um, so, I'm not really very well equipped to answer that question, but I know a lot of people who use the Garmin watches that have the GPS on board, 
but also have good battery life and work very well as an everyday watch to wear. Okay, scrolling back. Aha, what do you think of the RS Terror? Well, you're not gonna believe it, but I'm looking at two right now. Uh, just uh, there, there's two RS Terrors just there. The RS Terror is an excellent boat as a kind of modern equivalent, much more modern shape. And of course it's got the plastic construction, so very durable a modern replacement for the Optimist. Does the same job as the Optimist where it's um, for kids of a similar size, um, but the Optimist is famously uncomfortable because you just get to sit on a wafer thin piece of wood or whatever the boat's made of on the gunnel, like about that wide, that is where you sit. Uh, the Optimist is also famous for uh, acting as a foot spa as well uh, with the boat half full of of uh, oh okay I just saw this question come in from Thebolt Anton what is better the RS Fever or the Nacra 15 now this is like comparing a um, I don't know a BMX with a Porsche 911 uh, um, they do ve two very different things. The RS fit, I'm talking about the Terror, not the Fever. Okay, beg your pardon. But still with this NACRA 15 question, the NACRA 15 is basically an absolute hot rod of a catamaran for lightweight sailors. Um, absolute hot rod. I don't know why young sailors are being given something that is so amazing. But the NACRA 15 is basically the pinnacle of where catamaran sailing is at the moment. It's got curved dagger boards, so it lifts out of the water, weight, epoxy hulls. Um, it's a very lightweight boat, very fast. And um, it is in a really, truly incredible piece of kit. Uh, now we have got an RS Fever here. The RS Fever, I'm not saying it is not an incredible piece of kit that couldn't be compared to a NACRA 15, but this serves a very different purpose. This would be for two young or lightweight sailors. It's a double-handed boat with a spinnaker and um, it's a really good first double-handed spinnaker boat for young or very light sailors. That is what the RS Fever does. I'm just going to, I've got Ricky Nielsen here actually, I'm just going to ask him that question. Yeah. Rick, uh, RS Fever or NACRA 15? Easy, NACRA 15. I've seen one, they have a few in Mauritius at one of the Azuri resorts, went down and had a look. There you are, sweet. Really nice piece of kit. What's wrong with the Fever? Yeah, the Fever's <laughs> alright, I know people like it, but uh, NACRA, I'm a cat sailor, I can't, can't NACRA all the okay. way. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> That's Rick. We had to catch Rick because every week I think it's good to have a quick chat with Rick to make sure he's all right. Um, that so there we go. I think that is the answer to there. Um, but they do very different jobs. But that's not to take anything away from the Fever. The Fever has got uh, quite a sizable racing fleet. Um, I know there's a good racing fleet in the UK. Um, so for learning race tactics, and um, handling the boat around a race course, the Fever is a very good choice. All right, we're scrolling back. Scrolling back, it's all right, we're scrolling back. Oh, okay, we were talking about the RS Terror before, okay. Uh, 
Okay, I'm just scrolling back to see uh, where the next question is. There's a lot of, lot of chat in the comments uh, this afternoon. I'd have to say, if you want this, these sessions to have a bit more of a, a flowing question answering format to them, if you don't chat so much in the comments between yourselves, it means I don't have to scroll so much of all of that. Sorry to seem quite selfish, but um, I know it's nice that you all have a bit of a chin wag uh, while I'm talking about stuff, but um, thank you. All right, James says, uh, James, by the way, is Cowboy 123 uh, James says, did you get the writing poll figured out? Oh my goodness. I probably, I hope I don't keep promising that I'm going to do it tomorrow because, um, no, I haven't done it. Um, cause we're still very busy here at Wildwind and time is not, um, in abundance. I, what I'm going to promise is if by the time the season's finished, I still haven't done it. I'm going to keep a 16 built and construct this, um, contraption and then, uh, get out on the water and test it. So, um, sorry about that, James. It is coming. It's coming. All right. Scrolling back. Okay. Colin asks how, much performance would be reduced on a Hobie 14 by adding a passenger. Yeah, you're kind of, what you're looking at is what you're, uh, not the number of people on board, but the uh, combined weight. I would say you, I'm not, uh, I haven't actually sailed a Hobie 14 with more than one person, but I'd say if you're gonna be putting more than 100 kilograms on the boat, it's not going to perform particularly well. Um, anything less than that and I think she'll provide you with a lot of joy so if you're 68 kilos and you're going to be sailing with a young person who is very light I know my seven-year-old is probably about 30 kilos so um, a very young person let's say then the 14 will give you what you're looking for otherwise you're probably going to need a boat which has got a bit more volume uh, so there we go, the 14 isn't perhaps gonna tick the box there. Hello, Christian G13, nice to have you on board as always. Hello, Hein, yeah, Hein was here. Now Hein's there. Um, uh, is bad boy 94 unharmed after the capsize? Yes, thank you for inquiring into the well-being of bad boy 94 uh, just here, by the way. Bad boy 94. The only actual damage that resulted from that capsize was some broken trapeze elastic. Uh, so no real harm done there. And it's in my, the mindset that I'm going with here is it's really actually quite good when something breaks on bad boy 94, because uh, this is the boat that I'm taking to events and anything that's going to break I'd rather it broke here um, where we have very good safety cover and also we have very good facilities for repairing things rather than at an event where well you might be doing well in a race and then something breaks and then you can't complete the race disaster so much rather uh, give the boat a thorough testing here rather than at an event. Like last year at the Europeans, I was doing quite well in uh, one of the races. I think I was coming third. And then um, the spinnaker ripped and um, during a race, but we hadn't tested the spinnaker before the event. So if we'd have had some more hours on the boat with the spinnaker before the event, perhaps that would have happened before the event. We could have got it fixed and then happy days here again uh so better that things break uh while we're in the testing grounds rather than out on the battlefield okay scrolling back eric says i love yo vids thank you thank you i'll drink to that just on the water 
Okay, scrolling back. Okay, um, any more questions? Um, I'd just like to say you've got 10 minutes um, and then after 10 minutes, I'm gonna stop taking any more questions because I need to keep this to an hour. So when the clock reaches 45 minutes, uh, please don't ask any more questions because uh, I might not be able to get to answering them. Okay, Sickroft. Oh, I think this is the um, top cat that got killed. We left the catamaran in weeds and we don't know why, but somebody cut off the jib and the trampoline. There's a, wo a word for those sort of people, but we can't say it on the internet, but I think we're all thinking it right now. Okay, all the best to you and your top cat. And I hope that you can um, get her put back together so that you can get out there again and send it. There we go. All right, scrolling back. Okay, Johnny, Johnny Farrow says, in answer to last week's question about Hobie 14 shroud settings, here we go. Now this is the good stuff. With the sale, it should be so that when block to block, the leech te tension is ideal. Okay, so what you're looking for is when the blocks are touching, go and look round at the back of the boat take a look up the leech of the sail and you want it so it's not hooking to windward. You want it so that the leech is bang in line with the back Hello, um, of the boat. Chinese telephone holder failed there. Okay, all right, just got to somehow get this back. This way up, okay. All right, yeah, um, yeah, it all just happened there. There was just a small explosion from the Chinese telephone holder. Thanks for that, Johnny. And thanks, Mark, for um, giving us the info there on the Hobie 14. So, yeah, you want to be able to get that bad boy block to block so that the leech of the telltale is tight in the middle of the boat, but not coming to windward. I think that sounds right to me as well. All right, we've got multi. Okay, um, I'm from Denmark, Denmark, but just in between Sweden and Germany. By the way, love your videos. All right, nice one. Nice to have you on board. Uh, we have Robin. I found some pitting, ooh, in the top of my mast near where the comp tip connects. Is it absolute rubbish or is there going to be something I could do to keep it going. Um, yeah, it's a tough one, that. Mm. So I, I'm assuming that this, this pitting is in the, um, in the aluminium part of the mast, quite high up um, where the comp tip attaches. If the pitting is above the hounds, uh, where all the rigging attaches, to be honest, I don't, I haven't actually ever seen a comp tip mast for real in real life. I've only seen pictures. But if the comp tip part attaches above the hounds and it's pitting that doesn't go all the way through the mast, it's um, less severe, then um, I think you should be able to uh, just continue with it as it is. Um, if it is getting worse or if it's going all the way through, then you're perhaps going to have to get um, a plate riveted onto the mast or something just to cover that part of the mast. Um, that is what I would do. All right, scrolling back. Okay, scrolling back. Here we go, scrolling back. A lot of scrolling today. Yes, that's what I think, Robin. What you could do if you want is send me an email with some pictures and I'll see what I think and uh, put it to the uh, 
the kind of boat engineering department here at Wildwind and see what the people think. Oh, Angus, sorry, there's just stuff left on here, by the way, just in case nobody spotted it. Cool, thanks, man. Um, all right, scrolling back. Okay, we have Ricardo. Nice YouTube channel, mate. Hello from Brazil. Hello to Brazil. Nice to have Brazil online. Um, I have a Hobie 14. Got it from my dad. He got it in 1976. Cheers. Yeah, fantastic. I hope you're getting some good use out of that bad boy. And perhaps if you'd like to send us some pictures of it for show us your cat, that would be, that'd be really good because everybody likes to see Hobie 14s. I, th I think I'm speaking for everybody there. It's all right, man. Just go for it. Uh, the bag has oh. been found. It's there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I believe that all of the global catamaran sailing community like to see Hobie 14s. So I'm being distracted here by some uh, parking. Um, Okay, scrolling back. Okay, we've got Didums 55. Angus, who's just here, is laughing at your YouTube handle, by the way. Um, or maybe it is Angus, actually. Is. No, it's, it's all about being in disguise. You ever sailed a Dart 18? Funny you should ask. But yes, I sailed a Dart 18 for quite a long time. I had one for, I think, in excess of 10 years. It was one of the earlier Dart 18s that I had. It was from 1975. And I sailed that bad boy every single day. And that is how I got my ground, my, what would you call it? Base level catamaran sailing ability from... Uh, sailing the Dart 18 back then. I sailed it on the east coast of England um, at a sailing club called Felixstowe Ferry. Great place to sail, loads of tide. And um, towards the back half of owning the Dart 18, I did go to a lot of events, um, including the Nationals and the Inlands. Never made it to, I did do one Worlds. I did, I in fact did the first ever Dart 18 Worlds back in 1991 in Abbasock, which is in North Wales, uh, where I finished 248th, uh, incidentally. Yeah, How many pretty boats? good. Uh, 320 boats in that event. It, I think, possibly, still, that might be the biggest ever single class catamaran race in the world. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if any single class of catamaran has had more of the same types of boat on one start line as well. No fleet splitting. It was 320 boats on one start line. Now that is a big start line. But the Dartine uh, is a great boat uh, for learning how to race, learning how to sail catamarans. Of course, when you sail single-handed, you can helm on the trapeze. Even if you sail with two people, you can still helm on the trapeze if your crew's happy to sit get the spray in the face but um i think if you paid for the boat then they can take it um if they're just coming along free ride yeah yeah i like the dart 18. i would be very interested to get one out here uh to see how it would cope with the conditions be good fun all right scrolling back we're scrolling back All right, uh, all right, it's a bit of a conversation going on here. Still. All right, Chris is also keen to see this.
Frankenstein writing poll. A multi asks, how many kilos can a Hobie 16 take? This is a good question also. Um, it depends what you're wanting to do with your Hobie 16. If you want to go and be competitive at a competition, you probably want to be coming in pretty light at, I don't know what the minimum weight is. I think it's around 130, um, but you want to be pretty close to the minimum weight if you're going to an event. If we look at it statistically in an event, events are generally sailing the boat upwind and downwind. And let's say there's two types of wind uh, condition, just really simplifying here. Two types of wind conditions, light winds and heavy winds. The only time when a heavy crew, a heavy team is gonna be having an advantage over the light teams is in heavy winds sailing upwind. At all other times, the light team is going to have the upper hand, which means you're better off, if you're looking to um, race a Hobie 16, you're better off being towards the minimum weight rather than being heavy. However, if you're just looking at a Hobie 16 for... Okay, cheers, Jason. Nice one, nice to have you with us. Um, however, if you are looking at getting a Hobie 15 and sailing it for fun, then I've sailed the Hobie 16 plenty of times with more than 200 kilos on the boat and she still rips along nicely in a breeze and in a light wind, you'll still get there. It will just take a little bit longer with more weight on board. But um, check out the video from about, I don't know when it was, six weeks ago maybe, when I was sailing with Panos. Uh, with 220 kilos on the boat, still shifting. So um, yeah, she can take it. The boat is strong. That's a main, a very important point of the Hobie 16. It's very strong. All right, scrolling back. All right, just uh, ah ha ha! Got James here. James is the person who asked for a video that shows how to handle all the lines, let's call this rope management, uh, in a single-handed Hobie 16 scenario. Soon as, soon as I got this request from James, I was thinking, oh yes, this is the sort of thing I'd like to do. I'd like another reason to go out sailing a 16 single-handed. I was gonna do it this afternoon, to be honest, but uh, all the 16s, at Wildwind, we're very popular with catamaran sailors at the moment. So uh, no 16s available this afternoon. And of course, now I'm doing. Now that there are 16s available, I'm doing this video. So I'll probably get on to that tomorrow, um, and we'll take a look at this rope management. So hopefully, I'll have that uploaded um, by tomorrow evening in Greece, uh, and there it will be. Rope management. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm looking forward to that, actually. By the way, are you always in Vasiliki or on Mauritius in the winter? No, I just um, I just popped to Mauritius um, in the winter, just gone. I went down there in February. I got invited out there by Klaus, who is the owner of Wild Wind Mauritius. Very nice guy, and um, he got me to go down there to make some videos to kind of show the place off because this place while we're Mauritius is definitely worth showing off it is absolutely stunning great place great sailing conditions and um, lovely vibe and loads and loads of really really amazing sail aways almost every day another sail away to another fantastic paradise type beach with palm trees and water the colour of a swimming pool. But um, uh, as it stands, I'm not planning to go there this winter. I'll just be sat in Vasiliki until later. All right, scrolling back. Okay, we've got Steve-O. He's... Uh, Coming in, Go, GoPro Max on the birthday list. Fingers crossed I get it and can borrow it. 
Oh, I can borrow it next year. Thank you very much. Well, my fingers are also crossed. Hold on, we've got a crossing of the Wild Wind dudes here in a very straight line. It's like the Abbey Road cover, um, only different. Um, thought you should see that. Okay. Um, yeah, good. I hope you get that, Steve. I'd be very interested to see what we can do with such a device here. Chris says, when do you expect the world tour to take place? We've got some boats waiting in Galveston Bay, Texas. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, does, um, okay, here we are. Um, answers on a postcard here. Um, how much of the USA is still good for sailing in the months between November and March? What we would call traditionally the winter because it's diff it would be difficult, if not near impossible, for my American tour to be in the summer because of uh, the work here and it's so good here. Who'd ever want to leave this place? But um, in the winter, there is a, a glimmer of possibility. I think this winter is out with um, the disruptions that there have been. Uh, it's left the old schedule a little bit pickled. But um, possibly next winter, we could be looking at that. All right, scrolling back. Okay, we have uh, Sonka. I'm from Germany. Um, oh, and then James is showing off that he speaks German. Perhaps James is in Germany. Um, all right, there's a whole dialogue going on in German. Oh, all right, James asks, are you gonna show us how you did your mast? Yeah, um, yes, I really should get onto that because I've act I actually filmed the process. Um, all right, let's get, let's get mobile. The mast that, J uh, that James is speaking about is this fabulous looking piece of carbon that goes all the way up to the sky. Um, James says, I am in Germany and I am German. So perhaps that is not as much showing off as just being German and able to speak the language of the country that you came from. All right, yeah, this is the mast on Bad Boy 94. It's an absolutely stunning uh, piece of mast from uh, carbon fiber. And in the winter, I completely reconditioned this bad boy and she looks fantastic. And I did film it all, so I should just put that video together so that we can see um, what happened there. It did take a fairly long time, I'd have to, I'd have to say. Okay, scrolling back. Okay, cheers, Chris. Thanks for coming along and uh, thanks for all your help in answering the questions there. Very nice. Um, scrolling back. Uh, T-Rex, are you going to compete in any events this year? Um, well, I would have, a couple of days ago, I would have said no, but it has just been brought to my attention that the Greek Tornado National Championships are going to be at the end of October. And anybody who knows anything about tornado sailing knows that the top tornado sailors in the world um, are in Greece. Um, well, two of the best teams are in Greece, including Danny and Costas, who are the, I think, more than 10 times world championships uh, world champions. Um, I think they also just got uh, second place in the FA team worlds. So um, it'd be a really strong, fierce, competitive, maybe small, I think less than 10 boats, but it'll be a good nationals. Um, I was meant to be going to do the worlds this year, but that of course has been postponed like so many other events. All right, scrolling back. All right, I've got five minutes left. Okay. All right, T-Rex is thinking of buying a Nacra 15. Good choice. 
um, we're into it. I'd love to have a go on one. If anybody um, from NACRA perhaps is watching and they thinking, I think Joe should have a go on a NACRA 15, um, then just get it down here and we can do it. I'll um, give it a good test and, and make some videos actually on the boat. All right. Multi says, how many employees are there at Wildwind? Yeah, the instructors, at the moment, we've got um, 18 members of staff on the beach, um, 16 of which are sailing instructors. And then there's, um, we have one other guy who does the maintenance. His name's Marco, who is, um, we used to sail together on the Tornado and the Tiger. Um, uh, yeah, so 18, in a normal year, we'd be more like 23 to 25 members of staff, but we've had to cut everything back this year. How do we say? Uh, Techie, Tekka Helms, have you ever built a boat? No, I've never built a boat. Um, it's not, I'd have to say, it's not really the sort of thing that I'm into. I'd prefer to leave that to boat builders who are really good at it, um, like Captain Marstrom in Sweden, um, and then sail a boat which I know has been fantastically crafted by an expert in that field. Okay, Cormac says, Spitfire or Hobie 18? Ooh, what a question. Two quite different boats. The Spitfire basically does the same thing as a f as an f-18 so as a hobie tiger um or f-18 but it's smaller it's 16 feet long but it um it doesn't measure as an f-16 i believe i think it's a bit too heavy um the hobie 18 is more like the hobie 16 but just scaled up a bit for sailors who are heavier hmm it's a really difficult question to answer because the spitfire is an absolute bad boy it was the youth class in the uk for a while very nice boat um but the hobie 18 is a proper classic absolute yeah i if it was a question what would you prefer I would prefer to have a Hobie 18 Classic here because we've already got boats that do the same job as the Spitfire. All right, I'm going to stop answering that one there. All right, scrolling back. All right, scrolling back. Here we go. Um, quite a lot of scrolling here. Wow, a lot of scrolling. Okay, no more questions, please, because I've got to go in a jiffy. Uh, Cormac says, ever been to Ireland? I have been to Ireland, but not sailing there. I went on a family holiday to Dublin and I absolutely loved it. What a place and what a great bunch of people the Irish are. Um, big fan of Irish people and Ireland and, of course, of um, the other type of black gold. Um, love that stuff. Um, Shepherd's Home Repair, any recommendation for a good writing line set up? Um, the only, our, our writing line set up that we use here <laughs> couldn't be more simple. Look at that. Oh, what a view. Um, okay, it's the same on all of our boats, but um, here is how it looks. Um, we have a writing line tied around the Dolphin Striker which goes in a pocket and um, when we capsize we take the writing line um we chuck it over the side of the boat and the rest is history um i was thinking after the tornado capsize that i had was that just yesterday i think that was yesterday uh since that capsize because i didn't actually have a writing line on bad boy 94 so I was thinking of putting something on there, but I didn't want to do the same thing because that would be quite a lot of rope. 
of doing something under the trampoline. So when I've had a look at that, I will um, report back and make a small, a small uh, video to outline that. Sorry, I'm just jumping around a bit here. Okay, no more questions, please. Um, unless, uh, all right, scrolling back. Lot scrolling. Okay. Hunter asks, who is your favorite sailor of all time? That's a big question. But I think my first sailing hero, if you like, was Mitch Booth, the catamaran sailor who I've had the pleasure of meeting several times now and racing against as well. Um, but he was the first name that came to mind when posed with that question and I think that would be the who of who is the fave obviously can't take that just now um okay scrolling back scrolling back a lot of scrolling today um All right. Okay, we have David. Hi, Joe, loving your work, helping me increase the speed on my Hobie 16, really playing the main sheet now. But when ratchet on, but when to ratchet on, is it gonna help my aching muscles? Gosh, goodness, yes. I would say, unless the wind is so light that the pressure in the sail isn't taking the rope out of the blocks. Always sail with the ratchet on the main sheet. Um, I never turn mine off. Um, I turn, turn it off, that's probably because I never go sailing in light winds at the moment, but um, yes, if it's enough wind to trapeze, make sure the ratchet is turned on your main sheet. There we go. We're into short answers time. Uh, at the, what happens with these is at the start we have long answers and towards the end we have short answers because the wife was just on the phone. What are you doing? Where are you? We're expecting you home and all that sort of thing. So um, answers are going to have to be a bit shorter. But I just want to make sure that everybody gets answered. Okay, James, you know what? I recently talked to Peter from, ah uh, yeah, to Peter and plan to visit Wildwind this September, but change my plans. Okay, James, we'll see you next year. Eustace, please go sail. Um, will do uh, tomorrow. Unfortunately, as you may have noticed, my time window has expired. Um, TTV scopes, I sailed with my granddad on a dart. Nice, good to get out with your granddad, I think. It's nice family stuff, lovely. Um, Didums, love to come sailing on my Dart 18 around Greece. Yeah, if you're thinking about it, get in touch. Send me an email, totaljoyrider at icloud.com and we can look at some details. Eustace, sometime, I sail sometimes laser. Yeah, I did that once, made a video and I got a lot of responses. Not all of them were positive, I'll tell you. Uh, Sean, thanks Joe, you taught me how to sail. Thanks Sean. Uh, it's that sort of thing that makes all this seem worthwhile. So it's nice to feel that it's helping. So thanks for letting me know that it's helping. All right, scrolling back. James says, I bet there's no better place on earth to learn Hobie sailing, Joe, AKA Dr. Hobie, LOL. Obviously knows absolutely everything and whatever you search on YouTube, Joe is, oh no, that's not because I know better than anybody else. That's just because I make more videos than anyone else, which is making you believe that what I'm saying is true. But all that I'm saying is what I think is true. Other people may say something else is true. There are a lot of truths out there. But um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, and thanks for um, watching the videos, uh, for subscribing to the channel and for hitting the like button on the videos. That is what is moving them up the rankings so more people are getting to see them. The more people that see the videos, that gives me more motivation 
to make more videos. So if you help by hitting the like button, then I'm gonna make more videos because more people will see them. Does that make any sense? I think it does. Anyway, um, <laughs> are you one of the instructors at Wildwind or are you just Wildwind's YouTube star? No, I, I've been working at Wildwind since 1996. I started off as a sailing instructor, which I still do now, but not as much. Um, and um, yeah, I was the main catamaran and sailing instructor when I started working here. And so I've now been here for 25 years teaching sailing, but more recently, I've been like the beach manager here, so I'm responsible for everything that's going on. So I don't have quite as much time. And now I'm making all these videos, I don't have quite so much time to actually do the instruction, but the team of the instructors that we have working on the beach are very high quality. And for a lot of people, for most people, they can teach exactly what I could teach um, you, depending on what it is you need teaching. Uh, very good instructors. All right. All right. Okay, I'm feeling that I'm gonna have to abort shortly, so everybody who's asked questions more recently. Um, okay, oh yeah, there's a bit more of a chat going on between people. Hi, Kite Twins, nice to have you on board. Right, I have got to, um, do you have the C2 with the deck sweeper main? I'd like to see that monster again. Yes, we do. Uh, the, the C2's actually gone off on a little adventure at the moment to Ithaca. Okay, I'd just like to say thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thanks, Hunter. Thanks, Didums. Thanks, David. Thanks, James. Uh, thanks, Andy. Love the speed stick footage. Yeah, I'll get some more of that. And thanks, Shepherd's Home Repair. Is that? Oh, I should remember CAD Cam. That is um, the Hobie. I think Shepherd's Home Repair is the Hobie 16 with the brand new old mainsail. I can't remember who. Um, Scott. Is that Scott who's Shepherd's Home Repair? Anyway, thanks very much for tuning in only gone over by eight minutes surely the wife can't really do too much to me for going over by such a short period of time anyway i'll be back next week with more q and a here from the wildwind boat park um here's a panoramic of uh let's get me out of the panoramic um um we have got vacancies towards the end of september so if you are perhaps already in Europe and you're not sure what to do with yourself, you could be out here having a cold beer in this place. Sounds like a plan. Okay, thanks very much. See you next week for some more of the same. Thank you.